The subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on agency adjudication and other agency action. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. <clears throat> In today's hearing, we will address how some federal agencies bring enforcement actions against defendants before the agency's own in-house courts. This practice, when federal enforcers sue defendants but bring the case before the agency's own judges instead of before an Article III court, raises a number of concerns. In addition to considering these concerns, we will have the opportunity today to explore ideas for reform. Stepping back, the administrative state is made up of numerous federal agencies. A number of these federal agencies have the power to sue defendants to enforce the law, and the agencies can choose where to sue in-house or before an Article III judge. There are significant differences between facing an agency in an Article III court and facing the agency's own in-house adjudicator. For example, a number of federal agencies make their own rules of procedure and evidence. These rules can differ from agency to agency. And they differ from the rules used in Article III courts, sometimes in ways that work in the agency's favor. Often, administrative law judges preside over these cases. And unlike Article III judges, administrative law judges are hired and paid by the same agencies that bring the cases before them. Today, we can examine whether these judges are truly independent of the agencies that employ them. Also, unlike in Article III courts, when an agency sues a defendant in an in-house court, the defendant lacks access to a jury, a right the Seventh Amendment protects. Think about that. If the agency wants to opt for a jury trial, it can, but the defendant, whose rights are at stake, cannot. These and other concerns create a risk of perceived institutional bias that the deck is stacked against the defendants. The risk of perceived bias is made worse by the extraordinarily high number of cases won before their own courts. Because the agencies play by their own rules, it is easier for them to get preferred outcomes. Finally, there's arguably a lack of fairness and due process in some of these cases. Defendants are often unable to seek interlocutory appeals on evidentiary and other procedural rulings. The effect is that defendants with limited resources face long odds of success and prolonged and costly challenges from agencies. This imbalance allows agencies to force settlements through exhaustion and can be a way for agencies to avoid judicial oversight from a truly independent adjudicator. To add insult to injury, when defendants settle, some agencies use gag orders to prohibit defendants from discussing their matter critically. There's a serious lack of transparency in a administrative adjudication. It undermines confidence in the legitimacy of the proceedings and ultimately in the justice system. Today's witnesses are leading scholars and practitioners with significant knowledge of this subject matter. I look forward to hearing from our panel of expert witnesses and discussing these important items. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Correa, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this most important hearing. Um, Today, I think this hearing is about safety. My constituents back home, when they shop at a grocery store, buy prescriptions at a pharmacy, they wanna make sure, they wanna know that what they're doing is getting something safe. They're buying a safe product. They wanna know when they take their children to a playground, to a school, that they're gonna be safe, that they won't be playing in a polluted field that might affect their health. And they want to know when they're working that it'll be in a safe environment. And they also want to know that if they want to exercise the right to join a union, that that right will be respected. Let's face it, administrative law, most of my constituents won't know what this is, as they shouldn't. That's why they pay us, to do the job for them, to keep them safe to make sure that their families are safe. That's why I'm concerned today by the efforts we see from my friends across the aisle here in Washington to make it harder for these agencies to do their job. Legislation proposed by the majority will leave people in my community and all over America much worse off by paralyzing the very agencies responsible for looking after our food supply, our environment, our free market, our medications, and much, much more. 
Very soon, the Supreme Court will decide three cases which taken together could tie down our agencies in a new wave of litigation, uncertainty, and ultimately harming ordinary Americans and businesses on Main Street. Mr. Chairman, while some will claim the administrative state threatens free enterprise, let's look at the facts. Today, our economy is stronger than ever. Under President Biden, we've seen very strong economic growth, millions of jobs created, inflation under control, and a thriving economy that is second to none in this world. An economy, a government, that are functioning well with reasonable regulations. Again, this is about safety. Safety of those back home on Main Street. So I would say instead of attacking our regulatory agencies, let's help them do their job. Do their job better. Let's give them the resources, the funding they need to carry out the missions and let them use their expertise that they've acquired over the decades of work to do their job, which is protecting our friends and neighbors and people that live on Main Street. That, I would say, will keep our economy moving forward and give our constituents at home peace of mind that they deserve when they think of our government priorities and the job we are doing for them here in Washington, D.C. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling for this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Correa. Now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, today we are gathered not to discuss how the executive branch might work to better protect our air, our water, our food, or our health. Instead, the Republican majority has gathered us to give another platform to far-right advocates who want to dismantle the very agencies charged with protecting our health and safety. Not content to assault our government only in open and violent insurrection, extreme right-wing actors are also launching an assault through our courts to ensure that it is impossible for our government to function. Unfortunately, as we will see today, those two acts of bad faith now go hand in hand. Activists backed by billions of dollars in dark money are bringing cases to our highest court with the purpose of overturning decades of precedent, cases that will create uncertainty for businesses across the nation, that will undermine the protections we rely on for clean air and clean water, and that will enable corporations to evade the law. Based on controversial, novel, and aggressive interpretations of our Constitution, these actors are giving the court the chance to enlarge its power while undermining and limiting those of the people. In one set of cases, relentless and lower bright, they seek to upend decades of precedent holding that courts should respect Congress's authority to delegate to agency experts the careful task of implementing our laws. Instead, they would rather have judges who lack expertise in these often technical matters substitute their own policy judgments in place of those from experts. After a determined campaign to stock the courts with extremists eager to carry out their corporate agenda, it's easy to see why. A poor outcome in this case would affect innumerable rules and would undermine the very protections Americans depend on. In another case, Jarkizi, the plaintiffs are attacking a system that delivers quick relief from independent judges across the executive branch. A poor outcome in this case would mean that litigants no longer have access to approximately 2,000 administrative law judges, or ALJs, to decide issues ranging from Social Security benefits to securities fraud. If this happens, they will have to wait many years for the far smaller federal bench, consisting of fewer than half as many judges, to hear their cases. But for those who want to do away with ALJs, the endless delay and the inability of regulatory agencies to enforce the law is a feature, not a bug. Yet in another case, Corner Post seeks to subject regulations to challenge indefinitely, inviting a flood of litigation for years to come. The same forces behind these cases support other radical efforts to undermine regulations that protect Americans' health and safety. In the same term, the Supreme Court is being asked to overturn the FDA's authority and expert judgment in regulating mifepristone, a key tool in ensuring reproductive freedom, to block a national air pollution rule 
developed by many years, over many years by experts at the EPA that is predicted to save thousands of, tens of thousands of American lives, and to overturn the considered judgment of the ATF that bump stocks transform semi-automatic weapons into machine guns, capable of discharging hundreds of rounds of lethal ammunition per minute, as we saw in the deadly mass shooting in Las Vegas in 2017. These cases are not just an attack on the functioning of our expert agencies, but they are also an attack on the separation of powers, a key pillar of our Constitution and the basis for our system of government. They seek to take power away from elected representatives and the officials they charge with carrying out their mandate and empower judges to completely override the determinations of agency experts, substituting their own judgment, regardless of their comparative lack of technical knowledge and understanding of the underlying subject matter for the carefully crafted and scientifically based decisions made by agencies. These cases may seem to involve esoteric parts of the law, but they have the power to impact every person, every business, and every aspect of our environment. This war in government, this war in our separation of powers, will make us all less safe. It will cause serious, dam serious harm to businesses who will be mired in uncertainty. It will endanger our public health by undermining critical regulations, and it will threaten our economic health by letting large corporations break the law without consequence. This war in government hurts us all. I urge my colleagues to listen closely to what the majority's witnesses say here today. They have not been shy about telling the public exactly what they have planned, and I doubt that they will be any less bold today. They will offer a roadmap for the MAGA majority to continue its assault on the regulatory process and the critical protections that executive agencies provide. If they succeed, the economic prosperity fostered by President Biden's policies will be lost. Right now, the U.S. economy is one of the strongest in the world. Our, our rebound from the pandemic is the envy of the world. Unemployment has been at a sustained historic low. Wage growth is outpacing inflation, and consumer sentiment is up. We must not stand idly by while the far right continues its destructive mission. Instead, we must act to protect our Constitution, to protect the separation of powers, and to protect the American people. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member of the full committee. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I'll now introduce today's witnesses. Mr. Mark Chenoweth is the president and legal, chief legal officer of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, a nonprofit organization that engages in litigation and advocacy to protect Americans' rights. He's previously worked in private practice and served as chief of staff to then Congressman Mike Pompeo, legal counsel to Commissioner Ann Northrup at the U.S. Product Safety Commission, and as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice. Ms. Jennifer Mascot is an assistant professor of law and co-director of the C. Boyden Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Professor Mascot has written extensively on administrative law and serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. She previously served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel. Mr. Robert Alt is the President, Chief Executive Officer, and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Buckeye Institute. The Buckeye Institute is a nonprofit organization that works to advance free market public policy. He previously served as director of the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Ms. Skye Perryman is the president and chief executive officer of Democracy Forward, a nonprofit organization that works to advance democracy and social justice. She previously served as the chief legal officer and general counsel of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and has worked in private practice. We welcome our witnesses and thank them for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. 
Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Mr. Chenoweth, you may begin. Chairman Massey, Ranking Member Correa, and other uh, subcommittee members, thanks for inviting today's testimony. My name is Mark Chenoweth. I'm the President and Chief Legal Officer of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, a nonpartisan nonprofit civil rights organization founded by Columbia Law School professor Philip Hamburger to combat unlawful administrative power. NCLA's 14 attorneys pursued more than 50 original litigation cases against unlawful administrative agency actions last year alone, including two of them that Chairman Nadler mentioned. This work gives us an up-close, real-world look into the various ways in which administrative adjudication violates Americans' civil liberties. Adjudications, by the way, that enmesh 10 times more people than do federal district courts. So your constituents may actually be familiar with this process. My written testimony compiles a list of 25 pathologies of administrative adjudication for the committee's benefit. Before discussing a few of these, I'd like to highlight the legal mistake behind administrative adjudication. It's typically understood that federal agencies have no power to act unless Congress gives it to them. But the Constitution gives Congress only legislative powers. Congress cannot delegate a power it does not have, so it cannot delegate judicial power. Article III's vesting of judicial power in the courts is exclusive and mandatory. It says, quote, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish, unquote. By saying the judicial power shall be vested, Article III made clear that the location of that power was mandatory. It authorizes Congress to locate judicial power only in inferior courts, not administrative agencies. In setting up administrative tribunals then, Congress has unconstitutionally divested the courts of their judicial power, so it needs to unwind much of this unlawful regime. Apart from these structural constitutional violations, administrative adjudication violates the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and the Seventh Amendment. When I speak of Fifth Amendment violations, I'm chiefly referring to the lack of due process. Agency proceedings scrap the federal rules of civil procedure and the federal rules of evidence, substituting the agency's own rules or making things up as they go. Worse yet, a fundamental tenet of due process is an impartial judge, but ALJs are structurally biased in a pro-agency direction. They're not allowed to question the constitutionality or legality of the laws or regulations they enforce. They routinely shift the burden of proof to the respondent. They are beholden to their agency for their very employment. Unlike the Department of Justice in criminal cases, agencies are also not required to turn over exculpatory evidence to targets of enforcement. So even if the agency has proof of your innocence, it doesn't have to share that with you. Where is the justice in that? Sometimes the due process violations are even grosser. In early April 2022, SEC disclosed a so-called control deficiency, admitting that its enforcement staff had illegally accessed the files of its in-house judges in NCLA client Michelle Cochran's case, in George Jarkissi's case, and eventually in dozens of other cases. As the Wall Street Journal put it, it's the equivalent of a party in litigation having access to a judge's briefs from her law clerks. SEC dismissed 42 pending enforcement cases to dodge accountability for this unbelievable travesty of justice, and Congress needs to get to the bottom of it. But note that this kind of sloppy cross-contamination of functions illustrates the weakening of the separation of powers when they're combined in a single agency. This could never have happened at the Department of Justice. They don't share the same computer system with the judges. In terms of the Sixth Amendment, one aspect of NCLA client Ray Lucia's administrative prosecution deserves special mention. Ray Lucia tried to call his witnesses clients who would testify that they had never been misled or defrauded by him or his use of the term back test. Before they could testify, the SEC served those witnesses with last-minute subpoenas that required them to turn over all their financial records for the last five years from any source whatsoever on penalty of perjury. Despite being loyal clients, they didn't want to subject themselves to such an onerous and privacy and security violating a task, so they declined to testify. Having withdrawn them from his witness list, Ray proceeded to judgment before his ALJ without a single client witness to speak in his defense. Such witness intimidation would never be countenanced in a real federal court by a real federal judge. Such witness intimidation, in fact, uh, violates the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees the right to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in one's favor. But that right to secure witnesses not only doesn't obtain in administrative adjudications, as it does in federal court, but apparently witnesses who have agreed to testify can be excluded by agency dirty tricks. The Seventh Amendment is violated because rather than have facts found by a jury, the ALJ finds the facts in an agency proceeding, and the agency controls the administrative record on appeal. So even when a case reaches an Article III court for review, there has never been a jury, and the factual record amassed below gets deferred to by the judge. The Seventh Amendment guarantees the right to trial by jury in suits at common law. It thereby applies to all civil actions other than in admiralty and equity, including actions brought to enforce statutory rights that are analogous to common law causes of action ordinarily decided in English law courts in the 18th century. 
Equity involved property and contract claims, not government enforcement, and federal agencies do not sit in admiralty, so agencies routinely violate defendants' Seventh Amendment rights by conducting enforcement proceedings without a jury. For all these reasons, administrative adjudication is an abomination. It supposedly provides expert judges and more efficient proceedings in exchange for the denial of due process protections, but in truth, ALJs are not experts, administrative tribunals are not efficient, and the denial, and the denial of due process in agency tribunals with structurally biased umpires is pernicious. Congress has the power to abolish unlawful administrative tribunals and restore the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendment rights of the people currently subjected to these proceedings. It should do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chenoweth. Professor Mascott, you may begin. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. I will be testifying today in my personal capacity as an academic, and my views do not necessarily represent those of my institution. As the Supreme Court continues this term to review the constitutionality of widespread agency practices, the scope and proper role of agency adjudication is a critically important topic. Today, in modern practice, agency action touches nearly every aspect of American society. Agency officials make policies impacting religious institutions, schools, small businesses, individuals, and families. These actions and decisions extend into American pocketbooks, financial investments, contracts, health care, children's sports teams, and hiring and employment determinations as just a few examples. With all that is at stake, as the members of this committee know, it is essential to ensure that agency procedures implementing these policies are fair and equitable and preserve individual rights and maintain consistency with the federal constitutional separation of powers. It's true, as parties on both sides of the issues agree, that forms of executive branch adjudication have existed since the first year of the first federal Congress in 1789. Adjudication as a broad category involves just applying general rules of law to particular facts. But the early cases of executive adjudication, and in fact adjudication for a significant portion of our nation's history, was much more modest and constrained than adjudication today. And it extended into many fewer and more limited subject matter areas, such as the resolution of internal executive branch disputes and the allocation of government resources. Current administrative practice is substantially and even categorically different. Underlying agency power has ballooned over the past few decades with allocations of significant regulatory, investigative, and adjudicative power blended within single agencies. Agencies and commissions today have substantial power to make policy, to investigate and obtain documents, and then to determine internally within their own tribunals whether violations of those policies have occurred and the civil and monetary punishments that should be imposed for those violations. These adjudicative determinations can amount to what is essentially an exercise of judicial power, at least as that category was understood historically within our American constitutional system. Yet these agency determinations are occurring without the application of many of the individual rights protections and procedural mechanisms for fairness, transparency, and accountability that are the hallmarks of what we consider to be just administration of law here in the United States. And that procedurally loose and flexible agency adjudication has the potential to subject individuals and businesses to hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties, to lifetime bars on professional practice, and to years of investigations and litigation. Agency adjudicators often are referred to as judges within the administrative system, yet they are not appointed by the president with Senate consent. They do not have tenure and salary protection, and they are therefore not constitutionally independent. They are appropriately subordinate to the supervision of agency commissioners and cabinet secretaries and the president. This presidential supervision is critical to electoral accountability and to democratic checks. Yet that presidential accountability and supervision is anything but complete. The removal of agency adjudicators is subject to Merit Systems Protection Board approval under the current framework. And then there's the deeper question about whether executive adjudicators subject to the political process should be issuing decisions that interrupt American liberty and property interests. Historically, the understanding was no. But today, rather than merely reaching factual determinations or ensuring that parties comply with regulations or give restitution for wrongdoing, agencies are imposing significant penalties and sanctions that resemble exercises of judicial power. And in doing so, unlike in federal courts, agencies have significant flexibility to create their own procedural rules, giving an even greater home field advantage to those agencies. 
Further, agencies are often not subject to meaningful congressional guidance about when to bring charges in federal court as opposed to their own tribunals, and agencies are not even required to publish the factors that they rely on when deciding which of those tribunals to choose. Further, agent or individuals facing agency investigations and adjudication can be under enormous pressure to reach settlements with agencies, which then causes them to waive their rights to any future judicial review. It was not always this way. This term, the Supreme Court is reevaluating whether certain agency actions are currently administered through procedures and structures that are in tension with the Constitution. But regardless of the outcome of those cases as a constitutional matter, Congress has authority to act and reconsider whether agency adjudication is now expanded so considerably and so much outside historic procedural norms and rights protections that it should be curbed and regulated much more closely by Congress. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Mascott. Mr. Alt, you're now recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Massey, Ranking Member Correa, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to here to testify today on this important hearing. My name is Robert Alt, and I'm President and CEO of the Buckeye Institute. Through our legal center, the Buckeye Institute frequently litigates in the field of administrative law. As we began this morning, there were, there were some questions associated with whether or not constituents were familiar with or would be you know, sort of moved by issues of administrative law. So let's break it down to its basics. Everything that I need to know about administrative law, I may not have learned in kindergarten, but one key principle I did learn back then stands out. The one who cuts doesn't also get to do the choosing. Every child understands this separation of functions rule it's only fair. And yet, contrary to the founders' design, administrative agencies uh, perform legislative functions in making rules, perform executive functions in enforcing the rules, and contrary to the venerable cut versus choose principle, stand as judges in their own cases by means of in-house adjudication. The use of administrative adjudication to decide issues where sub substantial private rights are at issue raises issues of independence and fairness, particularly where these processes deny rank and file citizens of constitutional rights and procedural protections afforded in Article III courts. First, administrative law judges who fail to meet the Article III constitutional requirements of appointment by the President, confirmation with the advice and consent of the Senate, tenure during good behavior, fixed compensation, and placement in a co-equal branch of government all lack the fundamental characteristic that these requirements were designed to ensure, judicial independence. The constitutional requirements for Article III judges are not just empty formalism, but rather these requirements are background rules that together substantively create the conditions necessary for a fair and independent system of adjudication. Issues of judicial independence become even more pronounced when the adjudication is conducted by non-ALJ adjudicators. According to a study by the Administrative Conference of the United States, of the 17 non-ALJ types surveyed that preside over hearings in which their agencies are parties, more than one-third have no separation of functions, which means that the non-ALJ adjudicators may act as judge investigator, and prosecutor in cases involving their agencies. Whatever hat the non-ALJ adjudicator wears on a particular, the team remains the same, the agency. These non-ALJs are frequently subjected to performance appraisals that the authors of the ACUS study warned, quote, could serve as subtle and not so subtle methods of influencing non-ALJ decision making, end quote. Worse still, Many of these adjudicators are eligible for bonus based on factors that further call into question their independence. Unsurprisingly, agency adjudicators are therefore much more likely to rule for agencies. The Wall Street Journal reported that the SEC enjoys a 90% success rate in its own hearings, but only a 69% success rate against defendants in federal court. The New York Times reported similar statistics, finding that the SEC succeeded 92.7% uh, of the time with its internal judges, but only 77% of the time in federal courts. There is an undeniable home court advantage in in-house uh, adjudication. 
We shouldn't be surprised that individuals who one day serve as an investigator, another serve as a prosecutor, and yet another serve as a judge, and who are reviewed and given bonuses by the very agency for which they are adjudicating claims, would fine for the agency at a higher rate than independent Article III judges. The incentives are built into the system itself. The only surprise here is that anyone would defend in the name of safety this same process as being a reasonable substitute to an independent Article III court. Exacerbating the lack of independent decision makers, defendants in administrative adjudications are deprived of the right to juries on this, under the Seventh Amendment. They're deprived of, uh, of trials which are governed by the federal rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence, which provide due process protection for defendants, uh, including requirements for hearings, calling witnesses and discovery. Um, the constitutional requirements for Article III judges, in conclusion, are not empty formalities, but ensure the crucial independence of the judiciary in the exercise of judicial power. The usurpation of this authority by the administrative of state has led to adjudication by decision makers who lack independence and who therefore rule in favor of their own agencies at rates in keeping with that dependent status. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Alt. Ms. Perryman, you're now recognized for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Sky Perryman. I am a lawyer and the president and CEO of Democracy Forward Foundation, which is a nonpartisan national legal organization that promotes democracy and progress. Democracy Forward has the privilege of representing clients that make up the very fabric of our democracy across the nation, including organizations of small business owners and entrepreneurs, veterans, doctors, teachers, students, and so many more. Our North Star is a commitment to our country's founding idea that our government should be by, of, and for the people, deriving its power from the consent of the governed. When the government does its job and works for people within the bounds of the law, our society is stronger. And when the government strays from this purpose, serving only private interests or particularized agendas, our democracy and the well-being of people and communities throughout our nation is in danger. Today, our federal system of democracy, congressional power, and the ability of the government to deliver for the American people and for communities across this nation is threatened by certain litigation in federal courts and by other efforts. More than six cases on the current Supreme Court's docket could threaten our government's ability to deliver and do the job for the American people. These cases do involve the work of federal agencies, which are responsible for implementing things like Social Security, Medicaid, small business lending programs, drug and safety food protocols, and more. This term, two cases, known as Loper, Bright, and Relentless, seek to overturn more than 40 years of legal precedent, known as the Chevron Doctrine, and threaten the ability of agencies to effectively implement critical programs that Congress has put in place. Chevron deference recognizes the power of this Congress to delegate to agencies implementation of policies, and that when Congress passes a law that might contain broad or ambiguous or unclear language, that judges should defer to the expertise of federal agencies in implementing that law and not to um, generalist judges. Overturning Chevron as the court is being urged to do could have sweeping implications. Without courts deferring to agency interpretations in appropriate circumstances and to this Congress's intent, there is a concern that courts will substitute their own views for the experience of our federal agencies. While these cases, and um, members of the committee mentioned them in opening statements, but while these cases have received some modest attention from media outlets and policymakers, they've received far less attention than they deserve. Characterizations of these issues as concerning, quote, the administrative state often fail to describe the high stakes of these matters to millions of American people. Researchers and scholars have warned that everything from our nation's promise to support quality education to the work that our agencies do to protect the food and medical and drug supplies to worker and public health protections could be weakened if the court overturns this critical precedent. Among the risk is also regulatory stability which not only is important for the benefits and the services that federal agencies provide, but is also critical for the ability of small businesses and others to grow, thrive, and compete in our economy. In addition to Loper, Bright, Relentless, and Corner Post, 
We are also seeing cases at the Supreme Court that have arisen as a result of the federal government having to appeal orders from the U.S. Court of Appeals from the Fifth Circuit, um, where that court has adopted positions that not only undermine critical agency functions, but also undermine the way this body, Congress, has chosen to create and structure agencies. As explained in more detail in my written testimony, these cases involve challenges to the structure Congress has chosen in funding the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, as well as core functions of the SEC and administrative adjudication. The Fifth Circuit has also issued a ruling at the behest of special interest in Texas that undermines the FDA's scientific and longstanding regulation of an essential medication, a decision that has been opposed by both the medical community and the healthcare industry more broadly. Notably, many of the same interests that are seeking to undermine both healthcare access, including access to the essential medication of mifepristone, are the same interests lodging attacks against the work of other agencies in this Congress. Today, our federal system of democracy and the ability of the federal government to do the work and to deliver for the American people and communities is threatened. Attacks on the ability of our federal agencies to implement policies enacted by this Congress, attacks on the independence of the civil service, and attacks on administrative law judges all could have wide sweeping negative consequences for the stability and prosperity of our country. The stakes in these matters is high and cannot be ignored. Thank you for having me here today to speak to these issues and I will look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Perriman. We will now proceed under the five minute rule with questions. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> in June 2023, the FTC quietly issued a rule effectively diminishing the role of its administrative law judge, or ALJ. Under the new process, the ALJ will no longer render an, quote, initial decision, unquote, that would become the agency's decision, but instead issue a recommended decision that would be revised by the same FTC commissioners who brought a complaint in the first place. Mr. Chenoweth, uh, this looks on the surface uh, as if Chair Khan is unhappy with her track record in front of the ALJ and is trying to further stack the deck against merging parties. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that comment? I think you're right, Congressman Fitzgerald. The, uh, the fact that the FTC is trying to diminish uh, the role of the ALJ uh, in this way is troubling. It does suggest that, that they're looking for an outcome determinative uh, sort of result from the ALJ rather than asking the ALJ uh, to exercise independent judgment. It, uh, I think it just underscores what we were saying in, in some of our opening statements about the fact that these ALJs are not independent. They're under the thumb of the agencies at any point in time. They, uh, they, can, uh, they can be intimidated, they can be uh, demoted in the way that has happened uh, at the FTC. Uh, and that's why we need these sorts of cases to be in front of real judges in real federal courts. So further adding to this narrative that Chair Khan has been stacking the deck, just last week they announced that the FTC had hired Jay Himes to serve as one of the agency's uh, ALJs. And Mr. Himes has previously represented Open Markets Initiative Institute, excuse me, in front of the FTC, the very same organization in which Chair Khan's mentor, Barry Lynn, founded and which Chair Khan herself served as legal director. So again, let me ask you a kind of a follow-up question. So the FTC used to have this neutral ALJs uh, with a track record of careful deliberation and kind of this impartial view of antitrust law. Uh, should businesses or how should they anticipate or should businesses be worried uh, kind of uh, how this is perceived and the bias involved in it? Well, I think there's tremendous bias. The only thing I would take issue with that you said, Congressman Fitzgerald, is that the, is that the old ALJ is, is completely unbiased because if you look at the FTC's track record in front of its, its own ALJ, it won something like 24 out of 25 times in a row. And it was only the one time when the ALJ uh, didn't rule uh, in favor of the agency that the agency then turned around and decided to hire a new ALJ and demote the old one. So, I mean, that, it just sort of tells you everything you need to know uh, about how this process works in the real world. Yeah, I probably agree with, uh, with your comment. It seems to me the biggest problem to, is the FTC getting kind of two bites at the apple when it comes to challenging mergers. 
They can seek a preliminary injunction in federal court, and if they lose, can conduct a full administrative trial before ALJ. Court records from uh, the recent case of uh, Accent Enterprises versus the FTC revealed that over 25 years, the FTC has uh, not lost a single case that went through their own administrative process. And you compare that with the agency's success rate in federal court, which is you know somewhere around 50% probably. So perhaps even worse, they don't even have to listen to the ALJs. They can simply overrule the decision. And they do uh, nearly unanimously. And then previous testimony before the committee shows that the ALJ has overruled the FTC uh, only five times in the last 25 years. Uh, should Congress continue to allow the FTC to take, as I described it, two bites at the apple? Mr. Alt, do you have, uh, maybe you have a comment on that? Obviously, I think that, that that's problematic. And, I, and this is something that we see with multiple different agencies where they really have a choice as to how to, to proceed uh, with actions against potential defendants. Uh, with a general lack of transparency as to whether or not you know they begin with an in-house proceeding or go into federal court, uh, this is, this ends up being extraordinarily problematic. Going to your previous question with regard to the the lack of bias or the specialization uh, of the particular ALJs who are who are giving them one of the bites at the this apple. Um, you know, one if you actually take a look at these ALJs, frequently they actually don't have peculiar specialization in the areas. Uh, frequently, they may be brought in from another agency where they've got some previous adjudicative uh, experience, but not necessarily anything within the particular agency in question. Uh, so uh, you know, that ends up being problematic. But I think it really goes back to what we talked about at the beginning about the protections that are put in place in the Constitution for the exercise of judicial power. One of them ends up being the advice and consent of the Senate. And so when you have something like the question you had about the, the lack of bias on the part of the ALJ, those things can be explored uh, you know, by, by subjecting a nomination to the advice and consent process, uh, which you know, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee is fully capable of doing. However, you know, on something like, you know, uh, uh, with regard to many of these ALJs and non-ALJ positions, you, they are not subjected to that kind of review. Thank so, you, Chair. Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Wisconsin. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Correa, from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses today for your testimony. Appreciate you being here today. Uh, let me start out with Ms. Perryman. Uh, uh, I have two questions for you, ma'am. First of all, if the Supreme Court overturns Chevron, what would be the burden on Congress? First of all, to say, I, I think there would be a, a significant burden and, um, and also that overturning Chevron would act, act, actually usurp a lot of Congress's authority that it's already um, utilizing all the time in um, delegating authority to agencies to see that the laws are executed in their expertise. But what we know is that um, if the court overturned Chevron, there will be a range of litigation seeking to unseat um, longstanding uh, federal regulations that are critical to the, the policies and the um, procedures that are critical to our, our country's functioning, whether that's in the healthcare sector, in the environmental sector, in the small business sector, or otherwise. And so Congress would have a very heavy burden um, of having to um, try to adopt um, a variety of expertise that, frankly, this body has never recognized itself as having um, to be able to replace that expertise of, of agencies. I, I, Ms. Berman, uh, are we talking about here policy and implementation? Congress come up, comes up with policy, then the issue becomes implementation. So right. would, how much detail would Congress have to delve into to do our job? I think that's a... That's if a, Chevron is overturned. I think that's a significant question, and the fear is that, um, that the courts would require so much detail here um, that litigants would come in and challenge everything that wasn't detailed um, so enough that it would really compromise the ability of this body to be able to broadly legislate and serve the role that it needs to serve for the American people. Very quickly, Ms. Mascot, what do you think? 
Well, I actually don't think, I think that if the court says that Chevron deference is no longer an acceptable way to interpret law, we'll actually restore Congress's power and intent in legislation because all that the doctrine does right now is say. But that would mean our job would probably change quite a bit. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think so, Congressman. I think that what you enacted initially would be more faithfully um, applied by the agencies and by the court system. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that I think a Chevron lot of that is we're talking about intent here and the actual implementation. In the implementation, actually, I don't think that's related to Chevron deference at all. Chevron is about the initial questions of law. To the extent Congress enacts broad statutory terms that give agencies power to regulate, the courts would continue to give deference to the agencies under arbitrary or capricious policy. Thank review. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to get back to my second question, which is um, let's talk about the corner post case. If it's upheld, where do we go? What's the difference? What's the changes here? I think there's a real concern here because um, what the corner post case would do is it would um, potentially, if the petitioner's argument is sustained, a number of um, litigants could seek to try to un overturn long-standing federal programs, long-standing fe re uh, federal regulations that have already been um, adjudicated and decided um, in, in Article III courts and their lawfulness has already been decided. You could have a reopening of so many of these issues. And so combined with Chevron deference and the potential of the court to overturn that, it could be really detrimental to to people and communities throughout the country. What if you um, have the Chevron doctrine overturned and uh, corner post successful? What do you have? I think that's doubly devastating um, uh, for uh, so many programs, um, but whether they're healthcare programs, environmental programs, or a variety of other um, programs where the federal agencies are seeking to do the work that Congress put them to do. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Mascot, I'm gonna give you a minute to answer that as well. Well, I, I think um, just a larger point about the hearing today and Chevron deference and agency adjudication, I think that the members of this committee might all have different policy views about how much agencies um, should be regulating in the first place. But when it comes to adjudication, we're talking about basic issues of fairness and simply making sure that once the agencies have issued their policies, they have to um, apply those policies in a way that's consistent with longstanding individual rights protections, um, jury trial protections, and go into federal court and have some outside accountability, and I'm really glad that the committee is taking a look at these important issues today. I am too, because I think these are two, three, four, five cases before the Supreme Court, and uh, we're going to be having to live with the aftermath of those decisions, and I think it's important that all of us look at these decisions and the aftermath very carefully. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm out of time, and I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Correa. Now recognize Ms. Sparks. Uh, from Indiana for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I definitely can tell that we have a significant difference of opinion uh, what the government was created for. From my perspective, government wasn't created, only socialist governments are created to provide for the prosperity and promise it that it can never fulfill. It always runs out of money. Unfortunately, our government did too, uh, but our government did, was created under constitution to protect rights to life, liberty, and property. And unfortunately, administrative state became very, very oppressive. And you are, unless you are very politically connected and wealthy, you have no ability to survive in the current environment. And it's getting to the point that the little guy is getting destroyed. And you have no ability, don't tell me that any normal person has an ability to have an influence on executive branch and president to replace these judges unless you can give a couple million dollars to campaign of a president. You are screwed. And this is the reality what we have. So I think we have to really start thinking about how we're going to resolve that. And that's my question for the witnesses. We know that we're in trouble. And, you know, and I think Chevron doctrine discussion, it's a very serious discussion. I'm glad it's happening, and hopefully the Supreme Court will start doing some things to restore some imbalances. But what other things we need to do? Maybe, Professor Mascot, you can tell how we've gotten here and what are we going to do, because this is not a good situation. 
Well, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think, um, it's particularly since we're here uh, today talking about agency adjudication, I think for starters to look at some of the recent statutory changes in the explosion of agency power to bring enforcement actions within its own tribunal. One thing that often gets lost in, in the discussion, and you're raising some important points in your remarks, is how recently we have expanded internal agency tribunals. It wasn't until um, 1990, for example, that um, the SEC was able to bring and impose a lot of civil monetary penalties and important proceedings in-house, and then it was a few years after that that those penalties and the, those internal proceedings were applied to parties outside of registered entities. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act in particular really um, explosively expanded agency power to bring enforcement actions in its own tribunal, and it's unclear really why that's necessary. One of the stated reasons tends to be efficiency, but we know from litigation that a lot of the other witnesses have been involved in here that agency procedures themselves often take years to wind through the process. So I think um, as an initial matter, this uh, committee and Congress could go back and re-examine whether agencies should be imposing sanctions, lifetime bans, and penalties at all in their own tribunals, or whether they should go into the court system. And if you are going to preserve agency adjudicative authority, perhaps require transparency. Agencies maybe should have to pr um, publish the factors that they use when they decide how they're going to engage in these proceedings. Um, but they really should be much more restrained subject to the accountability of constitutional rights. And, uh, I don't think reports. accountability is going to happen within the agencies. I'm sorry to tell you. This is very, it sounds all good on paper, but it has to happen somehow in a different way. Mr. Alt, you have some ideas? Well, I, you know, ultimately, I think you, you, when you have these core issues, when you have, you know, the sorts of penalties that we see the SEC meeting out, where you permanently bar individuals from practicing uh, their profession, uh, where you where you see draconian penalties, these are these are questions I think properly should be decided by Article Three courts. Uh, I, I think, quite frankly, there is no substitute for that, and I, and I think Congress could go ahead and make that requirement. So we can start suing our agencies, correct? That's the only way to sue agencies for unreasonable <laughs> decisions? So what are we going to do? Well, it, it at least... Let allow people to do that? Or what are we going to do? Well, you know, in terms of that, that at least... What is the recourse? What is it if you're a normal American? What is your recourse if you have unreasonable fines that happening? What is it, what is it going to do on unreasonable decisions? What are you going to do? You know, what do you have, Mr... Chernovets, you have some suggestion. What do you do as a normal person that, you know, goes through this process that there is no transparency and they can do whatever they want? You have no ability to influence. There is no trial. There is no jury. There is, it's really, there, the process is so insider-driven and you have no ability. Unless you're well-connected, you're in trouble. Even if you're well-connected and wealthy, you don't have a chance. Uh, folks in front of the SEC settle their cases 98% of the time. It's not because 98% of the people the SEC goes after are guilty. It's because they can't afford to fight all the way through the process for years and years and years and years on end. The agency beats them down into submission and finally puts a settlement offer on the table that they can't afford not to take because they're out of money and they're out of, you know, they want to get back to practicing their career uh, uh, and, and they're just not able to continue to fight for their innocence. So I know I, th I think as long as these administrative adjudication apparatus are in place, that there isn't a lot of hope for people who find themselves uh, you know, arrayed against the federal government in these enforcement actions. You need the independent federal judiciary as the intermediary between the individual citizen and the state. Thank you. My time has expired. I guess we need to be a lot better lobby for the people. We as the Congress. Thank you. Thank the gentlelady from Indiana. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Perryman, while Congress sets broad policies, we cannot possibly craft the myriad of technical and detailed rules necessary to carry out those policies. It would be reckless for us to believe otherwise. That's why we write laws with the expectation that agencies are staffed with subject matter experts who can ensure that our laws have the effects we intend. How would overturning Chevron affect our efforts to combat climate change? Using mic. Thank you, Mr. Um, Ranking Member. 
um, of the committee. Um, I think it could be devastating. Um, th th as you've noted, there is um, significant subject matter expertise within our federal agencies. Congress um, has the legislative power and does pass um, laws, but those laws have to be implemented, and Congress cannot um, start to implement every single law it wouldn't, you know, um, that, that it passes. And so overturning Chevron, I think, will be um, significant um, with respect to climate, but also with respect to health care, with respect to so many other um, essential government functions. There have been a number of scholars um, and researchers that have, um, that, that have warned about the broad sweeping implications of something like this. And how about corner posts with respect to climate change? Um, uh, corner post presents a, a particular um, uh, concern, just uh, as you highlighted. Um, if the Supreme Court were to adopt the petitioner's argument in Corner Post, what you could have is a potential avalanche of litigation um, over long-standing rules and regulations that have been on the books for many years that are um, a subject uh, that have been on the books for many years, that could really unleash a lot of regulatory instability as well as um, problems for addressing the urgent needs that this Congress has asked the agencies to address. And same question, how would overturning Chevron affect our efforts to ensure clean water and air for our communities? And it's, a, it's roughly the same answer. Um, uh, but in, um, there are a number of policies that Congress has passed in order to um, ensure clean water and clean air, but those have to be implemented by our federal agencies. They implement and work on those policies every day. Overturning, um, replacing that agency expertise with the um, views of generalist judges um, is very concerning to both the integrity of the policies that Congress seeks to have implemented, as well as to the health and well-being of the American people. Same question on Corner Post. Uh, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the same answer. Okay. I mean, the real concern with Corner Post, of course, is that you have a number of rules and regulations, um, policies that are doing the work for the people that have been on the books for so long, and um, upending uh, the statute of limitations where any litigant can come in and seek to um, engage in judicial manipulation by trying to challenge longstanding um, rules that have already been litigated and found to be lawful. That's very concerning. Thank you. I'm hearing lots of contradictions from the majority's witnesses. ALJs are not sufficiently independent, and yet the FTC diminished the role of ALJs to lessen their importance. ALJs are not independent enough, so we should allow them to be fireable at will. Finally, from the majority's witness statement, statements, it appears that they are in favor of an Article III trial for every uh, TSA pre-check application. I cannot imagine the burden on our courts. Ms. Perriman, a poor outcome in the Jarkissi case would mean that endless cases from the public will be pushed from expert administrative law judges onto the already overburdened federal courts. What would the delay in these cases mean for litigants? I think the delays would be significant, as would, um, as would the delay for people who are seeking to be protected by the laws that agencies are, um, uh, um, that agencies are implementing. Um, I would also just note um, that uh, in the Jarkissi case, of course, and you, you mentioned this contradiction, but um, the same interests that are seeking to undermine ALJs overall or saying that they're not independent enough are also seeking to undermine the removal protections um, for them, which is something the American Bar Association, as well as a number of institutions, have supported in order to make sure that ALJs function um, in that quasi-role um, with impartiality. True. How many judges would we, how many Article III judges would we need to appoint to the federal bench to account for these cases? Um, I don't have a precise number, but you are familiar, I'm sure, with a report that came out of Thomson Reuters and some others on the overburdened nature of our Article III courts. And so I think you would have a significant number of additional Article III judges that would already, that would need to be appointed if not only- If we got rid of ALJs, would you say it might be, we might have to appoint 600 new Article III judges? Um, you know, we would definitely have to appoint um, a significant amount. More than 100, several hundred. I would think so. I wonder then how many judges the chair would like President Biden to appoint to ensure that these cases are heard in a timely fashion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Just to indulge the, the question there, I think um, the argument is that justice is too expensive, and I'm not buying that. No, um, the argument is that uh, if you want the pre uh, President Biden to appoint six or 700 new federal judges, Go this direction. I thank, I thank the uh, ranking member of the full committee for his questions, and I now recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Bentz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, from the remarks made by the ranking member at the initiation of the hearing, uh, almost the suggestion was that agencies 
should be able to wield unbridled power in how they uh, regulate. And, and I would ask Mr. Chenoweth, uh, if, if this is a reflection really of the shift of the burden that actually happens in these hearings uh, to the, 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 the regulated party as opposed to the agency who's trying to enforce whatever the regulation might be. Can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let, me, let me first just say that I know how many uh, federal judges you'd have to replace to replace the ALJs at the FTC, one or two, or at the SEC, four or five. Problem solved at both agencies. So I, I, I just wanted to, to get that in there. But, uh, um, but uh, to, your, to your point, uh, Congressman, could, could you, I, I, dis so, I distracted myself. Could you yeah, rephrase so, your so, question? So the question is, is there a shift in the burden of proof? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. There absolutely is a shift uh, in the burden when folks appear in front of, of these agencies. If you're in federal court and the, uh, and the prosecutor is coming after you, the state has the burden of proof to show that you have uh, disobeyed one of these regulations or perhaps broken a criminal law. If you're in front of one of these administrative agencies, far too often they do shift the burden to show that you didn't violate uh, the rule or that you aren't in. Right, the initial assumption is you violated the rule and it's your job when you come into that hearing to prove that you didn't. That's correct. That's, that's, what's, actually, that's, what's, that's what's happened in the, I don't know how many of these I've handled in my practice, but it, it seemed like it was always that way. Uh, it's on you, uh, Mr. Benz, and your client to try to prove that you didn't do it. Uh, I want to go to, uh, I was in some of my research in anticipation of this hearing, I looked at the, the Administrative Conference of the United States. So perhaps, uh, Mr. Mascot, you can tell me if, if you've heard of it, and is it worth uh, us reviewing the suggestions they make for improving the administrative process? The administrative conference, yes. So I'm a public member of the body, and it, I mean, I, yes, I think it's worth reviewing recommendations put forward by the administrative conference. I mean, obviously, it's Congress's job to structure administrative agencies. ACUS has resources to be able to give information that sometimes can help with that practice. And for example, I helped to co-author a study on the appointment of administrative law judges um, a while back. One other point, um, if we're looking at agency practice, if I may, just to the, to the comment raised earlier about TSA pre-check and agency adjudication, I think it's really, as as a member of ACUS, critical to think about all of the distinctions and the different kinds of agency sanctions and procedures we're talking about. And to Mr. Chenoweth's point, when we're talking about these significant penalties and sanctions, we're really talking about formal hearings conducted by a handful of people that have massive implications for uh, regulated parties. And that's very distinct from run-of-the-mill decisions about whether to uh, issue a, a pre-check uh, qualification or even social security and, and benefits. And if I may, if I may interrupt, because uh, I have, I, I okay. would like to talk about Chevron sure. for a moment. I'm Absolutely. going to go to Mr. Ald for his thoughts. Uh, it seemed to me that, that the, the issue when you take power away from the agencies you're doing so many times because of the political nature of their decisions, to suggest that every agency decision is somehow uh, uh, perfect by virtue of being based upon the facts and upon the, that's not true. And you can tell this by the whiplash that occurs after each different uh, party takes over the White House. All of a sudden there's a whole bunch of changes because it's political. So the question really is, if we, uh, if Chevron comes out the way I think it might and there is a restriction in that which uh, agencies are allowed to decide, are we going to be the better for it because we have federal judges deciding? That's the question. But before we, you answer it, I want, to go, I want to go to the quality of the ALJ judges uh, and, and ask you, is that the proper space for us to be focusing? If we can improve the judges in the administrative law space, is that the, is that the point of greatest impact? <clears throat> so I'll take those questions in turn with the latter. Should we be improving the, the ALJs? Please. Uh, you know, I, I, at a certain point, I think that's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It, it doesn't actually solve the underlying problem. You can have high quality ALJs, but it, they're not going to be independent. The, in, the deck is stacked against them, ultimately. Uh, in order to actually assure independence, you know, for these core questions where life, liberty, and property are at stake, those need to be answered by Article III courts. That, right. That's the constitutional design. As for your question with regard to Chevron deference, uh, you know, look, the elimination of Chevron, it, there's been a lot of questions about sort of what, you know, policy effects would have. It's ultimately policy neutral. The, quest, the question really comes down to, you know, this goes to what happens when there's an ambiguity in the law and whose job it is to interpret the law. You can go back to Marbury versus Madison. It is emphatically the role of the judiciary to interpret the law. 
Uh, and when there are these am ambiguous questions, I used to teach a class on uh, uh, legislation, which was really about methods of interpretation. The judges are well suited to, to suss out ambiguities, and we should let them do that. And thank you for that. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman from Oregon. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chenoweth, uh, it's been said on the street many times that uh, you and Charles Koch are best friends forever. Is that true? Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, he's my best friend or that I'm his best friend, no. Well, he is your biggest funder, though, to your organization, the so-called New Civil Liberties Alliance, which sounds like it's for personal liberties, but actually it's for corporate liberties, uh, I believe. But he is your biggest funder, is he not? Um, Yes or no? Well, we don't, we don't disclose who our funders are, uh, Congressman. Um, and you know and that uh, Charles Koch and I, his I, I can't tell you that, that over 70% of our you, funding you know meets that, the IRS definition of public funding. You don't want to tell us that Charles Koch is your best friend forever, I understand. But I, the well, fact, fact Congressman, the I, I worked, is, fact the matter is, I worked that, at Koch uh, Industries for four years. He was my boss. That's, that, that, that is a great connection that you've established. And that continues to this day, uh, strengthened no, it, more and more. That is not more, true, sir. That is not true. Especially when you come to Congress to carry the water for the Koch brothers. Uh, they are some of the world's biggest, uh, in fact, the second largest uh, private uh, corporation uh, engaged in oil and petroleum and chemicals and fertilizer, uh, polluting our environment, killing animals, human beings, polluting the air, water, and um, they don't want to have any agency. Point of order. They don't want to have. Point of order. Well, if you'd stop my time. What, 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 General Lady, state or point of order? I, 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 I believe that the accusation coming from uh, the gentleman from Georgia is bordering on libelous, and I would request that his words be taken down. I think that he's just accused people of murder and I think that's entirely inappropriate for an administrative proceeding. Mr. Chairman, words can be taken down only when directed to another member of the House. The point of order is overruled and it asks members to maintain a level of decorum. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized. Now, uh, Mr. Chenoweth, is it your, con is it your um contention that Congress does not have the ability to set up inferior tribunals to the uh, Article III courts? Uh, certainly Congress can set up uh, inferior tribunals, yeah, says, uh, but they can't it, it do it in that ways at, that violate due process rights. Article I, uh, Clause 8, Section 9, Congress has the ability to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. So is it your contention that an administrative law uh, or an administrative law judge, the office of a judge, is not a tribunal that can be set up by Congress? Well, I would refer the Congressman to the written testimony where I explain why the uh, tribunal's clause from Article I uh, does not, uh, in fact, authorize Congress uh, to uh, give judicial and power to clear, those tribunals. These are, are Article I courts. Are you or a, and a textualist? As I'm, well? Say that again. Are you an originalist in your judicial interpretation? Because, I mean, this is the clear language, a textual uh, approach to deciding these questions can be uh, employed also. I mean, it's pretty clear what the Constitution says that, court, that Congress is authorized to do. That's right. And as it says in the, in the written testimony, Congress can set up tribunals, but what they can't do is assign the judicial power of the United States to those tribunals. These well, are Article well, I courts. They're not Article three courts. As a matter of fact, isn't it true that these administrative decisions are appealable in court? They are appealable and eventually. They, and they are appealable in a de novo uh, process. They are not appealable de novo, sir. And, and in fact, the, the judges at the Court of Appeals uh, the, the, the legal determinations are de novo, but the factual record is set uh, by the administrative process without a jury. There are no jury rights in these administrative proceedings. And so when the case gets up to the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals can overturn legal mistakes, legal errors that have been made, uh, but they can't overturn the factual 
mistakes. Well, point well taken, uh, but the fact is there is judicial review of agency rulemaking and agency ALJ uh, decision making. Well, as I said, 98% of the folks at the SEC settle before they ever reach and the those, Court of Appeals. So folks, most of the time, the, there isn't review. Those, those folks who you talk about are not really uh, uh, just working uh, individuals, uh, somebody who's earning a wage. These are, uh, these are high dollar, uh, wealthy, uh, 2017 tax cut, uh, top 1% individuals, isn't that correct? Well, the woman we represented at the Supreme Court, Congressman Michelle Cochran, was a single mom accountant in Texas. And you set uh, that who, up real perfectly, too, didn't you? Well, uh, she came to us. Uh, she came to us because was, the SEC had put her through six years of hell, and you know she was not able to raise any of the constitutional objections to the tribunal because at that point, four or five different courts of appeals had said, you have to go all the way through the entire administrative process for five, six, seven, eight, nine, even 10 years in the case of Mr. Bandemir before you're ever allowed to get to federal district court, ever allowed to raise any constitutional objections to the tribunal. And the New Civil Liberties Alliance took Ms. Cochran's case and we pleaded with the Fifth Circuit and then the Supreme Court, you need a, to allow people to raise perfect, constitutional objections perfect, before they go through the process. Perfect case that had been set up in advance and run through the process. We know how you how you all the, work. The, the way that case came to us, Congressman, is that Ray, uh, Ms. Cochran learned about Ray Lucia's case because Mr. Lucia was at the, at the Supreme Court and she contacted Mr. Lucia and told him sure. about her story and said, sure. do you know anyone who can help me? And he referred her to the New Civil Liberties Alliance. That's how we got that case, Congressman. Certainly, thank you, sir. Thank the gentleman from Georgia. I now recognize the gentlelady, Ms. Hageman from Wyoming for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chenoweth, it is good to see you again, and I appreciate your testimony and your correcting the record from the gentleman from Georgia in terms of the actual facts and legal situation we're facing in this country. NCLA has been at the forefront of these issues and done, an, and done excellent work in exposing the unconstitutionality of much of the administrative state and the erosion of our constitutional foundation. I'd like to focus on this experience to demonstrate how the administrative law courts and ALJs or, and ALCs are facilitating the abuse and overreach of these federal agencies. Do federal agencies have incentives such as higher chance of success or procedural benefits to pursue enforcement actions with an ALJ versus an Article III court? Well, they absolutely have a higher rates of success as uh, Mr. Alt uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, we have those numbers specifically at the SEC, which he shared with, with uh, the subcommittee. Uh, I don't have figures at some of the other uh, agencies, uh, but we certainly know that, that these agencies tend to uh, pursue uh, sort of cases more aggressively in their own courts with novel theories uh, that they know that they couldn't get past a federal a district court judge. Well, and the administrative law judges are actually part of the very agencies who are the party pursuing the enforcement proceeding. Isn't that right? That is correct. Have you ever found any evidence of coordination or, or work between the ALJs and the agencies in actions that are before the ALJs? You know, we've, we found a few different things. In my written testimony, I talk about the fact that at the NLRB, for example, the prosecutors and the judges uh, are the same people. They just trade hats on different days. And you know, I find that to be shocking that, that you're supposed to, you know, as somebody who's up against, uh, on the other side of one of these transactions, that the person who's prosecuting the next guy in line is my judge and vice versa. That, that just doesn't seem like a very uh, likely scenario to create fairness from your adjudicator. Well, in my experience in, in taking lawsuits against the federal government is that the federal government and these administrative agencies essentially have unlimited resources, resources to prosecute and persecute citizens in this country, whether they are wealthy or destitute. It doesn't matter. They have unlimited resources. And uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Mascott, just real quickly, your testimony references CFP, CFPB authority to levy fines at $25,000 a day. Other agencies, such as the EPA, can bring forward daily fines more than double that amount. In fact, right now, the EPA can pursue fines of over $59,005 a day. I recently had a lawsuit where the fines were $37,500 a day for a gentleman who did nothing more than uh, straighten an irrigation ditch on his own personal property and affect 2.1 acres of land. By the time we went to trial, he was facing penalties of almost $65 million. 
Uh, how can the threat of the imposition of such heavy financial burden on regulated parties further deprive legitimate adjudicative relief for the Americans when they're facing those kinds of penalties? Well, it's significant authority, as you mentioned, and indeed for knowing violations, the CFPB can impose up to a million dollars of penalties per day. So I think, I mean, Congress has the power to be able to revisit this situation and make sure that rights are not intruded on in the first instance by simply, in a lot of these cases, taking away the newly given power for agencies to bring charges in their own tribunals. If they have, a, if there's an actual issue and there's been wrongdoing, it can be brought in federal court, it can be established through tried and true historical constitutional processes to to protect interests. Thank you. Ms. Perryman, do you believe that fines of, of, of almost $65 million for straightening an irrigation ditch on your property would be a violation of the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution, being an excessive fine? I, I'm not prepared today to talk, okay. about, um, a, to talk about a specific hypothetical. So uh, let's go back to you, Mr. Chenoweth. I think that it shocks the conscience, and I think it should shock the conscience of any person in the United States who actually understands that our government is a government of, by, and for the people, not a government of administrative agencies. So Mr. Chenoweth, we've discussed the abuses of the administrative state, uh, but it's not just the agency adjudica adjudication that is abusive, it's also unlawful at its core. And what I'd like you to do with the remaining uh, few minutes or seconds that I have, do you have any ideas of how we can reform this system so that we do not see the constitutional abuses that we've been experiencing, especially in the last 30 years? Well, I just really only have time for, for maybe one idea, which is that imagine how salutary it would be if ALJs only had authority to decide cases when both parties opt into the arrangement. Uh, Mr. Nadler expressed concern earlier about not having access to ALJs. You know what, if you want an access to an ALJ, have at it. I'm perfectly fine with that. But you shouldn't put somebody in front of an ALJ against their will, uh, and it would create an incentive for them to behave fairly. It would be more like magistrate judges in federal district court. It would ensure that only cases where significant rights claims were not at stake would be shunted to these ersatz tribunals. I think that would be a, a really good reform. It's just one reform, but uh, at least it would be an improvement over the status quo. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady from Wyoming. I now recognize Ms. Scanlon from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chenoweth, I just wanted to give you a chance here to correct something. Isn't it correct that after last year's SCOTUS decision in Axon that litigants can raise constitutional questions before an ALJ adjudication in federal court if they so choose? Uh, that's exactly right. So okay. the, the case Axon BFTC was paired with SEC v. Cochran, which was our case with Michelle Cochran. Okay. And the, there was one decision in both cases, and it held exactly as the Congresswoman said. As we said. said. Okay, I think yeah. there might have been a misstatement prior. So as we speak, conservative dark money groups are funding lawsuits before the Supreme Court and apparently witnesses before this panel to completely upend these essential government functions. Um, today's hearing is being used to advance an extreme legal position that would hamstring and dis dismantle the federal agencies that preserve our health and safety, that protect us from bad actors and fraud, that keep our air and water clean and our food and medicine safe. Americans overwhelmingly want a responsive and effective government, federal government. So let's be clear about what's going on. Our Republican colleagues don't want the government to work so that corporations are not held accountable for their actions. Regulatory agencies like the FDA, EPA, and OSHA employ highly skilled experts to draft the rules that protect public health and safety. Congress, through the legislative process, has given these agencies specific authorities to carry out with their expertise. I would hope that we could agree that subject matter experts, rather than lawyers and members of Congress, should be the people evaluating new prescription drugs or making sure that planes don't fall out of the sky. One of our witnesses today tried to put the concepts in today's hearing into terms that a kindergartner might understand, but I would note that those kindergartners ride to school in car seats that must meet federal standards. They eat food inspected for safety by federal regulators. They play with toys that don't use lead paint because of federal regulations, and they sleep in pajamas that are manufactured to standards so they don't catch fire readily. If the Chevron doctrine is shot down by the Supreme Court, detailed and technical decisions like these will have to be decided by judges or legislated by Congress. And given the burden and delays in our court system and the increasingly poor record of Congress in being able to legislate on the most basic of tax, tasks, that result is far from reassuring. Ms. Perriam, 
Perryman, if the Supreme Court overturns the Chevron Doctrine, what would that mean in practical terms for families and workers? And are our courts prepared to step into that gap? If the Supreme Court overturned Chevron, this would be another um, situation in a long line of situations um, where the government is going to be prevented from doing the work of the American people to keep them safe and to be able to enable communities and people to thrive. You've given some examples in your lead up to your question, um, but we have seen this um, throughout the federal system where there are a number of areas where Congress implements and passes a law. It is a law that people desperately need. Congress has the authority to do that, but agencies are, um, and Congress creates agencies. Agencies are the bodies that can implement that law, and their ability to have discretion in doing that where their subject matter expertise is clear, where Congress has not necessarily prescribed a thousand um, pieces of, of sure. policy detail is really essential in order to keep the government working for the people. Well, let's talk about those agencies because much of the te testimony today is centered on the implications of pending court cases. But your testimony raises another threat of the ability to the ability of civil servants, subject matter experts who do the work to implement the safeguards that Congress has legislated. In your testimony, you highlight a related threat to good government and the ability of the federal government to do the work of the American people, and that's an unprecedented effort by right-wing special interests known as Project 2025 that would gut our civil service workforce in the event of the Republican candidate winning this year's presidential election, permitting the firing of the nonpartisan subject experts who make our government agencies function and making those currently independent civil servants subject to political influence and loyalty tests. Can you comment on the threat posed by Project 2025? I think Project 2025, um, it's been published, is an um, incredibly um, concerning threat to our overall system of government. You've highlighted a major one, which is a threat to our civil service, the ability of people um, to do the work of the American people. Civil servants, there's 2.2 million of them. They're in all states across the country. They swear an oath to our Constitution and um, have, um, you know, have an obligation to do the work regardless of political ideology or partisan agenda. So threats to that independent civil service um, are incredibly concerning and you see that, um, you see that summarized in, in Project 2025 as well as in a number, of other, um, a number of other efforts that we're seeing from extremist organizations. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would just seek unanimous consent to introduce an article by Kate Shaw entitled this quiet blockbuster at the Supreme Court could impact all Americans. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, I yield back. I now recognize Mr. Moran from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ald, I wanna start with you. Mr. Chenoweth was just mentioning uh, this question I have for you, and that's about the ability for defendants to potentially opt out or remove these cases to Article Three courts. That's one of the ironies of the administrative adjudication is the agency can actually choose to bring it in federal court and seek a jury trial. Would a defendant's right to opt out of in-house courts help address this imbalance? If so, how? It certainly could. I, I, I guess my question is the devil, devil being in the details, making sure that the, the prov provision which would permit for removal would be sufficiently uh, uh, automatic or easy, you know, so as to preserve the rights. I mean, one of the things that I think we, we've all talked about is the degree to which the current proceeding, you know, essentially stacks the deck in such a way that it exhausts the resources of defendants before they ever have a chance to see an Article Three tribunal. So anything we can do to actually make it so that they can avail themselves at the first instance uh, of an independent Article Three judge would be a, a great improvement over the current process. Thank you. Mr. Chenoweth, back to you on uh, a new matter. We haven't talked about gag orders, but your organization, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, has raised a concern about gag orders in administrative settlements, particularly settlements involving the SEC. Would you describe for folks that are watching what a gag order is, how agencies use these gag orders in settlements, and why exactly it is that you have a concern with this? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So there, there's a gag rule that the SEC implemented in 1972. It's one of only two agencies that we're aware of that gags folks who settle with the agency. They passed it as a housekeeping rule, uh, and a housekeeping rule doesn't have to go through notice and comment, but a housekeeping rule also isn't supposed to affect anyone outside the agency. Obviously, the whole point of a gag rule is to gag the defendant, so it does affect third parties outside the agency. So it was unlawfully promulgated by the SEC uh, this was back when, uh, when Bill Casey, I believe, was the chairman of the SEC during the Nixon administration. 
Uh, and so you had the Nixon administration wanting to gag people who settle with the agency. And then today we have folks defending that uh, in the current administration, which I don't really understand why they're so eager to, to gag everyone. Uh, the Department of Justice doesn't gag anyone who settles with the Department of Justice. Uh, but the Securities and Exchange Commission insists on pain of settlement, that in other words, they will not settle a case with you unless you agree uh, to this language. And believe me, we've tried, uh, and they won't do it. And the reason is that they don't want anyone out there criticizing the agency and explaining exactly what happened. These 98% of people who settle with the agency, they don't want any of those people to be able to, to talk to Congress or talk to the general public about what is happening to them, what they went through, what the... Uh, you know, what the deficiencies are in the SEC's investigatory and adjudicatory processes. Uh, and it's a very effective gag that the agency, that the SEC and the CFTC is the other one that has this, I should mention. Well, it, it uh, seems it's unconstitutional. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems contrary to the very basic principles of the First Amendment, that we are now gagging individuals so that they don't criticize government and government's overreach in their life. Would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, you, there are some rights that you can give up in, in, in exchange for settlement. You can give up the right to appeal, for example, uh, as, part of, as part of a settlement. But the First Amendment shouldn't be something that uh, that you give up. And certainly if you were in a federal district court, a federal judge couldn't take away your First Amendment rights as a part of a, of a, of a penalty uh, against you if you were to lose in court. So if you go to court uh, and, and win or lose, you still have your First Amendment rights. But if you settle with the SEC, you lose the right uh, to speak uh, in, anymore about your case. And uh, you know, some of the folks that we have as, as clients, sir, uh, are in their 70s, 80s. They've seen co-defendants go to their grave never being able to clear their name. Uh, and, and these are folks who, uh, they, they didn't do, you know, if you, if you got the whole story of what they did, you wouldn't think that they did anything that was worth going after at all, let alone uh, something that they should have to wear as a badge of dishonor for the rest of their lives. Professor Mascott, I want to come to you for the last question, and anybody else can weigh in after she does. But I'm, I'm curious about looking to the future. Where do you see... Uh, red flags where this type of in-house tribunal might spread even further, either by subject matter or new agency where we're seeing creep into other agencies to take away the rights of citizens to actually go to the judicial court system to get their claims adjudicated. Where are we seeing that? What should we be aware of and where should we, wa where should we be watching? Well, I think that as agencies continue to get more and more regulatory authority in more subject matter areas, there's just going to be more incentive to um, produce broad regulations and engage in burdensome investigations and then um, adjudicate these uh, challenges within their own court system. So I really do think Congress should take a look at whether um, now that we've had a few years looking at how this operates and have the Supreme Court looking at it, whether um, all of these questions of judicial review should be taken off the table by just requiring agencies simply to go into court in the first place. If the agencies have a valid rule and they're imposing it against the right people, they should be able to bring those charges in federal court without any problem, and it can solve all these questions of constitutional rights. I also think the solution is an interim matter of allowing people to remove um, from agencies to federal court could be a good one to look at. Um, in addition, I think there doesn't seem to be any reason why members on both sides couldn't agree to requiring agencies to publish more rules about how they're publish more information about how they decide they're going to bring charges and what procedures they use to bring these charges and bring the kind of transparency that uh, we all have to follow here and in the federal court system. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Texas. The gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Massey and Ranking Member uh, Correa. And thank, thank Correa. And thank you, each and every one of you, for your witness and your testimony today. Um, thank you for coming to this hearing to discuss the importance of regulatory agencies and our need to have experts review and propose rules and our guidelines. We need regulatory agencies because they are an invaluable source of knowledge and information gained from experts with an intimate understanding of uh, very niche areas. These individuals are oftentimes more qualified than us here in Congress to provide guidelines, recommendations, and regulations. The knowledge possessed at regulatory agencies provides us with a cleaner environment, safe food, and a growing economy. The almost 2,000 administrative law judges who are subject 
experts operating at these agencies are the best means to ensure that cases are heard by experts and make informed decisions within a reasonable time frame. I'm sure most of us here, in particular my colleagues and I, would hate to go to a family law judge to handle a tax case. So why would we take the entire caseload of 2,000 administrative law judges with subject matter expertise to the less than 900 federal judges already struggling with backup dockets? Recommendations made by ALJs are subject to review by federal courts, meaning a decision by an ALJ is not an end all. The process that we have in place is fair and it has fairness in mind. Our agencies were structured like this for a reason. As members of Congress, we don't possess the knowledge or the expertise and the time that is necessary to cover every single issue that may need some form of regulation. Nor would our government be able to function if these agencies were eliminated or further limited from doing their jobs. Checks and balances are crucial. And balance means that we are collectively doing our job to keep our agencies in line without taking away their ability to regulate and to resolve. We should want safe travel. We should want safe medications. And we should want safer workplaces. Ms. Perryman, my, Perry, Perry, my question is for you. If the Supreme Court were to rule in favor of the respondent in Jarkesi and limit the power of ALJs to hear cases, what would this mean for agencies looking to adjudicate cases? Well, I'll, I'll make a, a few comments um, to your question, Congresswoman. One is, I think if the, if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Jarkesi, there's also a ruling there that would really usurp Congress's power. Because Congress structured the SEC in a particular way and acknowledged these overlapping functions um, that ALJs provide in that situation. And so I don't want that to get lost in today's discussion, where there has been a lot of, <clears throat> there's been a lot of, um, um, there has been a lot of discussion of um, executive power or overrunning of executive power, but these are ways that Congress, in fact, um, structured many agencies. Um, but I do think that it will make our agencies um, less effective, and it will certainly make um, uh, the American people suffer because there will not be um, there will not be um, more timely ways of, of resolving administrative disputes. Thank you. My second question, then a follow up, is. How would the long delay for these adjudications affect our small business community and members of the public if they have to go through the federal system? We certainly know that delay is um, a concern, and we've even heard some of the witnesses here today talk about that in different respects. And so um, I do believe that these, um, that this uh, decision in favor of um, Jarkesi and some of the other uh, proposals that have been mentioned here today would lead to unnecessarily delay, delaying the ability of the government to do its job, which is, again, how Congress structured these agencies. We certainly don't need any more delays in this body. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank the gentlelady from Georgia, and I'll recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing, and I appreciate the witnesses for appearing. Mr. Alt, since agency adjudication denies defendants' jury trials and impartial rulings on interlocutory appeals and procedural challenges, do you think this leaves defendants in a, in a negative position overall, um, worse off than if their case had been heard in an Article III court? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if, if their claim was before an Article III court, they would have access to their seventh, their seventh Amendment rights. They would have a number of additional procedural protections provided by the Federal Rules of Evidence and the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, neither of which apply in administrative proceedings. And it really, you know, quite frankly, you know, I, I think it's worth taking a step back and this really is what we're talking about in this hearing. It's not whether we're going to have the policies that Congress wants if, in fact, these agencies, you know, are regulating, you know, as experts, implementing Congress's uh, uh, desires with regard to the, these policies, whether it's clean air, water, et cetera. They should have nothing to fear in going before an Article III tribunal. They shouldn't have to stack the deck. They shouldn't be taking away the rights of Americans, and shame on them for trying to do so. 
while agencies can opt to bring their case in a federal court and seek a jury trial, can defendants do the same? No. So would you agree that this presents a pretty significant imbalance in agency adjudication and that Congress uh, has options and, and what would you recommend Congress uh, do in regard to addressing this imbalance? So I, uh, there's a couple of ways that, that you could address it. We've talked about some of them here today. Uh, you know, one is to, to you know, sort of even the playing field and get, make it so that both parties have to consent to appearing before an ALJ. The other option is offering for removal authority if the agency chooses to uh, initiate its proceeding against a defendant in an administrative tribunal to give, them, to give the defendant the ability to move for removal to a federal court. Uh, you know, a third option, which I think I mentioned, is simply, you know, in, in some of these cases that involve core rights, is stripping the authority of these agencies to initiate internal proceedings and requiring those to go before Article III tribunals. I should add, and I think, we, I think all three witnesses have emphasized this, the claim that, you, that this would re require thousands of additional judges is hyperbole. The claim that this would deal with all Social Security claims and so forth, also hyperbole. If we're talking about, you know, for instance, these core issues where you've got, uh, where you've got substantial fines, loss of the ability to continue to conduct your, your business, things of this nature. You know, in, in the case of, of the SEC, it's, you know, what, I think, what, five ALJs? I mean, you know, th these, this is a much more limited remedy than what, what has been suggested. Professor Mascow, would you agree with that assessment? Absolutely, Congressman. Um, the 2,000 number uh, sounds high, but it also um, includes the hundreds of Social Security judges that Mr. Alch referencing. And not only is what's happening in the Social Security courts different in kind than what we're talking about here today, but um, while those judges have the title administrative law judges as a statutory matter, they're actually not the formal administrative law judges or hearing officers that the APA is talking about. So they do something different, and they're hired. It's just, just a totally different role than, than what we're talking about, the regular AL who are more about 100 in number, a little bit over 100, and in the really core agencies, as Mr. Chenna was mentioned, um, fewer than a dozen typically. The other uh, point that was raised earlier about expertise of administrative law judges, actually most of the current administrative law judges were hired under the old um, in place until about 2018 civil service hiring system, which allows ALJs to be moved around from agency to agency. So there isn't necessarily specific subject matter expertise that's grown up over decades uh, anyway. Um, but also, uh, we are talking most fundamentally, I think, um, about just the rights and the safety and the interest of the American people and want to make sure that those rights are protected in the federal court system and that Congress as the elected body is making the um, initial key uh, policy decisions. And if I can make one more point, on, on the issue of expertise, if Congress wants to benefit from regulatory expertise, one a possible way to do that would be to get recommendations or studies or proposed rules from the agencies and then let the elected body of Congress have an up or down vote on whether those policies are going to be made effective um, so that the people's interests are protected. Thank you. I, I thank the gentlelady, or thank the witness, and I yield back. The gentleman from Virginia yields back, and I'll recognize Mr. Ivey from Maryland for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the hearing. I, I came into the hearing with a very different perspective than I have at the moment. Um, but let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So um, there have been sort of comments about rulemaking and expertise that come with that. I, my sense is that you're not really focusing on that today. Uh, and also the discussions about Chevron and some of the other lines of cases that have come. My sense is you're not really talking about that so much today either. It's more, as opposed to being doctrinal, it's more structural. And so the argument I think you're making is that um, administrative law judges are biased and there's a better way to go if you have Article Three judges who are neutral, et cetera. Is that fair, Mr. Alt? Well, as I understood the scope of the hearing, it was essentially administrative adjudication of related topics. So yes, and okay. and, and going to what the bias of, of the those right. adjudicators. Professor? Yes, and yes, and yes. All right, hit the all right. Yes, I agree so, with you, Mr. Ivey. All right, well let me ask you this, because let's let's assume for the sake of argument that I agree with your thrust with respect to administrative law judges. Um, I've appeared in front of administrative law judges. 
I don't necessarily think Article III judges walk on water necessarily either, which, uh, so there are challenges in both courts, especially from the financial exhaustion standpoint. Um, but I am not clear on exactly, and Professor, you were just touching on this a little bit, but you know, if you're gonna move towards eliminating these article, uh, I mean the ALJs, um, and I'm not exactly sure how many there are. We got the 2,000 number. You all are talking dozens. It seems to me it might be more in the middle, but there's an easy way to find out. Uh, and maybe when you have a chance to submit comments later, you can actually run down the number and send it to me. Uh, and the other piece would be that I'm curious about is the cost differential between Article uh, Three judges and ALJs, because it's, you know, it's money we're gonna have to figure out how to do that. Um, do you, but I, I, do you mean the salary difference, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, it's you know salaries, and then I, I think they probably get law clerks in a way that ALJs don't, for example. And there's a whole structure and mm -hmm. pension system, all of that stuff. Send that to me instead of making me figure it out. Uh, but I'm not exactly clear on how that transition would work, um, and I'm pretty sure that you know I don't even know if we got a bill pending in the House, for example, that would do the transformation that you're talking about. Um, I'm also not clear on whether these would be Article Three judges. So would these be, they would just get assigned to DC Circuit, for example, or for, you know, uh, Eastern District of Virginia, or would they be in the Federal Circuit? What, what do you exactly have in mind there? And then I guess you, there's also the Article One option, which is DC Superior Court, as I understand it. Those are Article One judges that have full power to adjudicate and I, by, I think by most standards, do it just as well as the Article Three types of judges would. Um, so if you could send me that kind of information, that'd be helpful. The other piece would be, so you've sort of talked in terms of some of the sorts of intermediate uh, reforms you'd wanna see. Um, turning over exculpatory evidence, citizens' right to opt out, the removal option that you talked about, the burden, shifting of the burden of proof, or disallowing the shifting of the burden of proof, gag, gag orders, um, all of which I agree with, I think, the points that you all made on, on those. Um, can you give me a list of what those would be uh, moving forward? Uh, let me say this, too, as I end up, because I've only got a minute left. I am uh, very nervous about shifting these sorts of adjudication activities to Congress because we are not prepared to handle those uh, by any stretch of the imagination. If there is a desire to do that, and I hear that from my Republican colleagues periodically, there was the Office of Technology Assessment that was eliminated in 1995 as part of the contract with America, and that had been created with the thought of providing a body of experts, scientific and technological experts, uh, who could help Congress resolve those types of issues. I don't think that we should be, you know, Chairman Massey has that kind of background, but most of the, most of, uh, of us here are lawyers or something along those lines. So I think it'd be risky for us to try and take that on. And we do these two hour hearings as opposed to the two week hearings that you'd have frequently if some of these administrative proceedings to resolve highly technical issues like the ones we were talking about, how much how many article, you know, how much arsenic can you have in water for parts per billion? I certainly don't think we're set up to handle those. But if there are other types of options that you all see, please give us those. Your, your testimony talked about some of those things, but, you know, the overall thrust was constitu is constitutional issues. If I agree with that, what are the specific proposals you're talking about that we could implement um, in a reasonable way uh, and try and address those. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ivey, and thank you for always coming to these hearings with an open mind and listening to the witnesses. A lot of times we fail to do that. We come with, you know, predetermined outcomes. So I appreciate Mr. Ivey. Um, and I'll recognize Mr. Issa from California for five minutes. And I'm going to use a minute of, uh, because you, you hit on a sore subject for me, and I just want to share it with you. I was on energy and commerce also at the time in the Bush administration, it was the uh, EPA that arbitrarily, with no science supporting it, lowered how much arsenic per billion and took half the wells in New Mexico offline without any science showing that what level unsafe becomes safe in, in arsenic. 
Uh, and they did so because they said, well, at the level we picked, we know it's safe. Arbitrary, capricious, and they got away with it. And by the way, that was George W. Bush's EPA administrator. And if I could do it over again, I'd be more incensed than I am two decades later. With that, um, we've dealt in a couple of areas I think that are important. Many of the uh, members on the other side of the aisle seem to think that the, and one of the witnesses, that over, overturning Chevron would be just the end of the world. Let me ask a question. Uh, before the 1980s, were we doing okay without Chevron uh, as a doctrine? Professor? Yes, certainly this body um, has, the, has the power to be able to make clear statutes that can be interpreted by courts. And indeed, So we actually, got through 200 years without Chevron doctrine. Yes, sir. You, you think we might survive as a body uh, if, if it went away or substantially was changed? Well, I do. And, and the author of the opinion, Justice Stevens, actually, is there's evidence maybe he didn't even think he was putting in place a, a great new doctrine. So it certainly should be revisited, I think. And today. is it fair to say that the history post-Chevron is that administrations look to put ambiguity in their suggestions into legislation for the very purpose of giving themselves freedom going forward. There's certainly a risk Antonin Scalia had noted that it seemed like there was a change in what administrations tried to put into legislation after they had that opportunity. Absolutely, in legislation and then also in the agency's own rules, making those ambiguous so that they can fill in the gaps later. And, and then from a litigating standpoint too, Congressman, the, what, what's been told to me by folks in the Solicitor General's office, for example, is that the agencies will come to them and the question isn't what does the law mean, the question is what can we get away with? How, how far can we push our interpretation and still get Chevron deference to it? And for all four of you, do you agree that administration after administration over the last, let's say, four or five administrations have created rule changes that are each one somewhat the opposite of the one before and yet said they were faithfully supporting the intent of Congress? Is anyone there that disagrees from the left to the right? Okay, well, then... That, I think, is the best reason for Congress to be more explicit. Yes, lest we have every election turn into a flipping on its uh, side. Uh, Congressman, can I speak just briefly to that? So the, the claim was made that, that getting rid of Chevron deference will undermine regulatory stability. And to your point, it's exactly the opposite. Chevron is what creates regulatory stability because the agencies are allowed to change the rules willy-nilly. The rest of us can't, but the agencies can. And so that's creating the stability. If we get rid of Chevron deference, we'll have much more regulatory stability going forward. Now, from time to time, Congress does turn rulemaking or executive orders into law by simply affirming them. Is there anyone that disagrees uh, with the fact that Congress at any time can look at actual actions of the administrative branch including executive orders and simply codify them in law if we in fact concur with them. You can do that. And at that point, the court is bound by them and, and Chevron is no longer a problem, even if one might say they went outside the original intent. So, right, as long as they're within the bounds of the Constitution, if there wasn't statutory authority before, but now Congress has said there is, then you've solved that problem. Is there anyone here that believes that uh, Article I gag orders, meaning agreements with the power of the government forcing someone to not disclose, other than on an ongoing case, those sort of agreements, uh, inherently is a heavy hand of government and that Congress should consider reducing or eliminating the authority to, do, to force the entry into those agreements. NCLA would welcome that for sure. Okay, uh, then my, my, my last one is, I've heard, and I think I heard on, uh, pretty well, that if you have Article I judges, and they are not appealed to Article III, but rather they simply go to their commissions, and those commissions can, on a, uh, a de novo basis, relook at it and reverse them, then in fact, an Article I is not the equivalent of an Article III, and that ultimately, if that is the case, like the Federal Trade Commission, others that routinely, 90 per, SEC, 90% or more reverse uh, not guilties with guilties, then is there anyone who sees the harm in that situation 
of the defendant not going through double jeopardy and simply being able to say, I want to go to Article 3 lest I go through the process of Article 1, win, and then have it reversed by the commission. Anyone see that as not able to be a, a legitimate out that we should grant as a body? If any uh, witness wants to answer that briefly. Only those who object. Seeing none, I'll take it as a yes. Thank you. Thank the gentleman back. from California. Ms. Belint from Vermont is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to bottom line it. I think at the crux of this hearing for me is about freedom from harm. And it's clear that we have a fundamental difference in vision with, with Republicans. My colleagues on the other side um, almost uniformly see bad intent in the actions of, of federal regulators. And rather than understanding these people as civil servants who are using their expertise to follow through on our directives in, in Congress, um, they're often cast as, as power hungry, malevolent actors uh, bent on taking away fundamental rights of, uh, from the little guy, right? And I think we all, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, right, we come here to fight for the little guy. And it's really unfortunate because um, the public protections furthered by our agencies, including for the environment, for workers, for passengers, for Americans' personal finances, and public health really do benefit regular people in, in my home state of Vermont. And reasonable rules establish the basis of our economy and it give people, like I said, freedom from harm. That's, that's what drives me in my work. And freedom from, by extension, corporate greed, from disease, from fraud, um, from preventable accidents. And the administrative state fulfills a core role of government, which is protecting the public. Ms. Perriman, would you characterize the administrative state as providing key public protections rather than about limiting personal freedoms? I would characterize the work of this body as a body that is charged with um, passing laws that do the work of the American people. And what our federal agencies do, which many have formed, have said, called the administrative state, but what our federal agencies do is that they implement um, those um, policies and they implement those laws um, in the form of regulations because this Congress can't do all of it. And in doing that, um, there are subject matter experts that have um, expertise that can um, help implement those laws faithfully in the way that Congress intended. And of course, there are checks on um, all of the powers um, in our government, including um, in administrative agencies. Uh, but that is how I would characterize it, is um, these are agencies that are meant to do the work of the people. And how important is it, from your perspective, that agencies receive deference from the courts to implement the policy goals set by us, by Congress? Right. I mean, Congress, uh, Congress often um, delegates authority to the agencies to do just that. And so the question that is at issue in some of these cases, including the, the Relentless and Loper Bright cases, is not about whether policies will be interpreted or policies will be implemented, but it's whether, um, it's whether uh, judges um, would substitute um, their views for the expertise of agencies in those cases where Congress has delegated the authority for that implementation and um, expects that some of that discretion would go to the agencies. I appreciate that. And I know um, I'm going to shift, because I don't have much time, um, to the issue of Social Security, something that's incredibly important to Vermonters. And I'm concerned that attacking and undermining the ALJs will make Americans less safe by making it harder for agencies to enforce the law against bad actors that violate regulatory protections. And Congress has already thought the issue through and designed formal adjudication under the APA to ensure ALJ independence, neutrality, and, and to insulate them from public, excuse me, from political interference. And if Congress or the courts upset this, well-established framework, well-established framework, we're likely dealing with a wholesale paralysis of the federal government, which I sometimes fear is what the intent is all along. Ms. Perriman, can you explain how ALJs are crucial to strong and robust enforcement of the law and how this impacts uh, folks who are dependent upon the work 
of the Social Security Administration? Well, certainly with respect to ALJs generally, this is one of the concerns that led Congress to pass the Administrative Procedure Act, which allowed for that agency adjudication and which, of course, was signed by President Truman. Um, with respect to Social Security uh, more broadly, there are a number of um, legal theories and cases on the court's docket that could undermine um, the ability of agencies to carry forward with those programs. Um, there are some nuances with respect to particular types of administrative law judges or adjudications that apply to certain programs but overall threats to the independence of ALJs, which you do see in some of these cases where there are arguments to, um, where there are arguments um, in general, both in special interest sort of publications to undermine our civil service or in court to undermine removal protections, but under, um, undermining the independence of the agencies and in particular adjudic um, uh, um, uh, adjudicatory um, uh, people that are uh, adjudicatory bodies is, is highly concerning, including for Social Security and a range of other programs. Thank you. I see I'm out of time. I just want to say it's a particular concern for me. I don't want to see Social Security undermined or rolled back um, or harmed because of because we're, we're rolling back ALJ independence. So I thank you for your time. I thank all the witnesses for being here. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady from Vermont. I now recognize the gentleman from uh, North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, for thank five you, Mr. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And one of probably the best and most glaring examples of the bureaucracy and the growth of it. Uh, the Biden administration's methane rule from the EPA was delayed until I think about March 8th, and one of the reasons was that this 1,690-page monstrosity kept jamming printers. So they couldn't get it printed in the Federal Registrar. James Madison said that Congress would fight to the death to protect his Article I authority, and I think that was true in James Madison's time. I've been here for five years, and what I've learned is Congress will fight to the death to protect their membership in Congress. And if that means delegating their authority to the agencies and making tough decisions and doing all of those things, we have been more than willing to do that on a bipartisan basis for 50 years. We spent a lot of time talking about the Chevron Doctrine, and rightfully so, and the growth of agencies and bureaucracies. But one of the benefits to rolling back the, age, the Chevron Doctrine is maybe it's gonna force Congress to actually do the job. And maybe the people who elect people to represent them in government should actually take the tough votes instead of having 1,690 page bills that keep jamming printers that affect North Dakota energy producers, North Dakota ag producers, and everybody else in between. And with that, I would yield to my good friend from Wyoming. Thank you, and uh, that was a, an excellent summation. Mr. Chenoweth, we hear routinely from my colleagues across the aisle, and even from Ms. Perryman today, that federal agencies are needed because they possess the relevant expertise and that this is a wasted effort because they are working efficiently for the American people. That's not my personal experience, and I've had a lot of personal experience with working with federal agencies. Can you please explain using Lu Lucia and Cochran to show how many of our ALJs are actually not legally or prepared to handle these cases? Uh, absolutely, and, and uh, as, as you know, Congresswoman, my personal experience with administrative agencies started when I was an attorney at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So, you know, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't take second to anyone in my, uh, in my desire uh, for safety, uh, for protecting children, for doing the things that these agencies do. Uh, but that's not what the ALJs are doing. Uh, that's not how the system, uh, with all due respect to Ms. Ballant, that's, that's not the way the system is functioning right now. It might be the way that Congress meant for it to function, but it's not the way that it's functioning uh, right now. Uh, with, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Ray Lucia. Uh, Ray Lucia fought for years and years and years uh, in, a, in, in administrative uh, action in front of ALJ Cameron Elliott. And I wouldn't ordinarily say a judge's name, but the reason that I'm saying Cameron Elliott's name is because he told everyone who appeared in front of him that he never didn't side with the agency. He, he told them that. And he told them that because he wanted them to all settle. And that's not the kind of thing that a judge should be doing, but that's what ALJ Cameron Elliott did. And that's why when Mr. Lucia got all the way to the Supreme Court and won his case, um, the decision, you know, the, Unfortunately, the, the court sent the case all the way back to be tried again in front of, uh, but they sent it back to be tried in front of a new ALJ. The Supreme Court didn't want the same ALJ to hear the case because even they were convinced at that point that he had been railroaded and gotten a raw deal from you know, the original ALJ that he appeared in front of. I'm pleased to say that ALJ uh, Cameron Elliott is no longer an ALJ at the SEC. Unfortunately, uh, he got promoted to a different court. 
Well, you know, and I guess I'm terribly surprised today by my colleagues on the other side who are willing to admit in a public hearing that they are not qualified to do their jobs because I believe that we are. In fact, I know that the people from Wyoming sent me here to do exactly what I'm doing, which is reading bills, drafting legislation, and addressing the issues that are important to them. And if we're not capable of that, and if someone is not capable of doing it, I would encourage them not to run for Congress, because perhaps they should be looking for another job. Well, I, um, I know for sure that, that members of Congress are every bit as smart as commissioners uh, at these agencies, because my boss at the Consumer Product Safety Commission was former Congresswoman Ann Northup. <laughs> And a I, Kentuckian. A good Kentuckian, absolutely. And, and Mr. Alt, I want to just briefly address with you that it's my understanding that there are, not only do we deal with the ALJs, but there are more than 10,000 non-ALJ agency adjudicators who also conduct uh, evidentiary hearings. So this isn't just a matter of the ALJs. We have an entire other layer of bureaucracy or adjudicatory power that has been somehow transferred to administrative agencies in violation of our Constitution. Yes, and I think this raises even more substantial questions associated with independence because the, these non-ALJs are not governed by the same restrictions under the APA. They, they tend to be more beholden to their agency heads. It, it raises even more serious concerns about whether or not you, you have a truly neutral decision maker uh, as a defendant. I wish we had several more hours to discuss this topic, but alas, I'm out of time, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. It's been an excellent discussion. Mr. Chair? I yield back. Mr. Chair? Um, for what purpose does uh, Ms. Belint seek to be recognized? Thank you. I just ask unanimous consent to enter into the record an article by ProPublica called We Don't Talk About Leonard, the Man Behind the Right Supreme Court Supermajority. Without objection, so ordered. What purpose does the gentleman from California seek? Chairman alike, unanimous consent to also uh, submit for the record a article by the Coalition for Sensible Safeguards explains how maintaining the current robust system of agency adjudication is critical for efficient and effective enforcement of our nation's protective status and statutes which help keep our workplace safe for drinking water, free of contaminants, and our hard-earned money from fraud. Without objection, so ordered. And I'll recognize the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Yield Mr. Mr. Gates. Massey. Thank the gentleman from Florida. Uh, you know, I want to talk about two entrepreneurs and, and ask the witnesses questions about these. Uh, the first entrepreneur I want to talk about is uh, Mr. Eric Flannery, who I think the Buckeye Institute has represented. And some might say this is uh, orthogonal to the hearing today, but I think it's on topic because his, his business, his sole proprietorship, was the target of uh, regulations here in Washington, D.C. that really should have been the purview of Congress if we were following the Constitution. Mr. Alt, can you talk about uh, Eric Flannery's case and how he's been prosecuted? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, the Buckeye Institute represents Eric Flannery, who runs the big board here on Capitol Hill, a, uh, a bar and restaurant. During the uh, the pandemic, he uh, he was subject to the shut the long shutdown in Washington D.C. and was able to hold on throughout that, only to see uh, the city ultimately put in place a vaccine verification requirement for all all bars operating in D.C. He would literally have to have someone at the front checking vaccine IDs. Mr. Flannery took the position that that was not appropriate for him to do, and so he, he issued a tweet the day before the regulation went into place saying that everyone was welcome uh, in his bar. For that, the full weight of the D.C. government was brought down upon him, four separate agencies engaged in pulling his licenses and closing his business. Um, pursuant to a series of emergency orders that had been issued, and to your question, uh, Congress has the authority to regulate the federal district under Article I, Section 8, and they've delegated some portion of that authority uh, to the D.C. government in the Home Rule Act of 1973, but they retained authority to themselves with regard to overseeing the government. Any piece of legislation that is passed by the D.C. government uh, has to be subject to review under 30 days. It can be repealed by Congress. Uh, it, with one notable limited exception. Like, uh, the D.C. City Council can issue emergency orders which can only be in effect for, I believe, 45 days. 
DC government went ahead and stacked these emergency orders for a period of in excess of two years, and it was pursuant to this authority that Mr. Flannery was fined and closed and subjected to multiple penalties. Uh, and so in our federal lawsuit, where, where we currently are pending before the DC Circuit, uh, we have challenged their, the, the proper authority to do so and recognize that they have, uh, that DC government in fact usurped Congress's authority by denying Congress the ability, reasonable oversight as is required by the Constitution. And, and uh, this man you're representing is somebody that I've met. He treats his customers like family. He treats his employees as if they were family. And uh, so I reject the notion that was raised earlier that these agencies and this, these kind of laws and administrative rulings is only used against big companies. And now shifting my focus to another entrepreneur, I, I would argue the most successful living entrepreneur in the United States at, at the moment, uh, I count the FTC, SEC, NLRB, FCC, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and FAA, among the administrative agencies who've gone after this gentleman for having the temerity to say that he might not vote Democrat um, and for having the temerity to say that he was going to buy a social media company to make sure that free speech could be preserved. Uh, and also, you know, for having the temerity to bring broadband to rural America after over a decade of government spoon feeding cronies with the false promise that we would get broadband in a rural America. He finally did it. And for that, he's, he's been brought before all of these agencies. Mr. Chenoweth, do you want to talk about any one of those cases uh, and how the administrative agencies have been used to wep uh, weaponize against a successful entrepreneur. Well, it's it's certainly very suspicious the way that all of these agencies, and you might call it a whole of government effort uh, to go after Mr. Musk since his purchase of, of Twitter. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a, an explanation for all of this happening at the same time that isn't at least a little bit nefarious. Uh, in terms of rural broadband, you know, he was, uh, I, I believe the contract that he got from FCC that was revoked was for under a billion dollars. It was 800 and some million dollars, and the replacement that's been proposed is something like $42 billion uh, instead, uh, to, just to avoid using Mr. Musk's satellites to provide the rural broadband. That doesn't seem like a good use of taxpayer money to me. Uh, but, but from an administrative law standpoint, my concern with what's happening to him is that if, you know, you, you say maybe the, the most successful entrepreneur in America, certainly one of the richest and most powerful entrepreneurs in America, if the administrative state can do this to him, just imagine what it can do to Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Main Street in, in your congressional district. Uh, th they just don't stand a chance against the full power of the federal government in these administrative agencies without an independent federal judge standing between them and the federal agency. I, I thank the, the gentleman, Mr. Chenoweth, and I want to, uh, my time's expired, I want to uh, submit for the record a dissenting statement of Commissioner, FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr in that case against uh, Starlink. Uh, it says in part, today the FCC adds itself to the growing list of administrative agencies that are taking action against Elon Musk's business. I am not the first to notice a pattern here. Two months ago, the Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote that the volume of government investigations into his business makes us wonder if the Biden administration is targeting him for regulatory harassment. I certainly think so. Uh, if you find a turtle on a fence post, it didn't get there by accident. And if you find eight of them on fence posts, something's going on. Uh, and I ask unanimous consent to submit this for the record. Okay, without objection, so ordered. And I now recognize Mr. Van Drew for five minutes from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have to say, I love the turtle analogy. It's pretty neat. Uh, you know, our federal agencies have become emboldened in many ways and in many ways unchecked. Too often, they abuse this power. We've seen it used in ways where we go after political opponents, forcing burdensome regulations on American industry, and pushing partisan politics on behalf of presidents. But it is the practice of in-house adjudication where we have seen the system stray so unbelievably far. It's a world where agencies are the prosecutor, the judge, and the executioner. It's unfair, and I believe it's un-American. 
The House has already passed legislation that will cut back on the expansion of administrative state by passing the RAINS Act and the Separation of Powers Restoration Act. But it's clear there absolutely is more to do about this abuse of power. We simply cannot regulate the agencies back to where they should be. We can't regulate them to good behavior. We need to fundamentally rethink and restructure this framework. Mr. Ault, can you elaborate on how you believe the denial of the Seventh Amendment right to jury trials in administrative adjudications undermines the foundational principles of our legal system? Thank you, Mr. Drew, Van Drew. Um, I think it really goes back to uh, what's going on here is very reminiscent of what you saw in the founding era, which is to say, the uh, essentially, uh, the British Parliament went ahead and shifted authority to a to another tribunal, the Court of Admiralty, in order to be able to actually handle certain tax and other matters that would traditionally be handled by a court where there would be a right to jury. Uh, and they did so in order to prevent uh, that jury right from attaching. Uh, this was, this from the time of Magna Carta forward, uh, has been understood to be a, a, a fundamental right uh, to have, have access to the, these sorts of civil juries, in, particularly where you have these kinds of fines, the loss of property, life, liberty, or, or property potentially attaching. Um, and so what you see actually in these administrative tribunals is, is painfully similar. We're shifting the adjudication to tribunals where you don't have those rights, where you're not actually, you don't have the opportunity to be heard by a neutral arbiter, uh, and where, the, where again, you know, we've seen throughout the course of the hearing today, oftentimes, quite frankly, the adjudicator may be, may be someone who wears the hat of prosecutor on a different day. They may be someone who the prosecutors have had access to their computers. There's not genuine independence. This is not a peer who's being able to determine your rights. And so uh, it, it creates a fundamentally unfair uh, and non-independent process. And, and I agree with you. I, uh, it is fundamentally unfair and it is wrong and it is in no way, in no way, nobody should kid themselves, our founding fathers never ever envisioned what is happening now with these agencies. It's also a great irony that while an agency has the freedom to take its case to regular court, the agency does, and it can even ask for a jury to decide, the people or businesses they're going after don't get to make that decision. How can that be right? Do you think letting these defendants choose to have their case heard outside the agency's own courtroom could fix this unfairness? And if you do, how might that work? I'll address that to you first, Mr. Alt, but anybody else who would like to answer that question is welcome to as well. So the, <clears throat> the answer is the less friction, the better. The, and the earlier at the process, the defendant would be able to, remo to remove to a, an Article III court. You know, that would be you know, a more sufficient remedy. Um, you know, shy of permitting, permitting, you know, sort of requiring these actions to be brought in Article III court to begin with. But, you know, my, cons my concern in any of this is uh, not putting barriers to the exercise of that right uh, that could actually impair a defendant from being able to exercise it. So long as they're able to do so quickly, I, I think that would, be, that would be a huge step in the right direction. Thank you. Professor? I agree, and I agree that the earlier uh, at the point in the process, the better to remove. So before a lot of the investigative power has been wielded and a lot of the incentives to force folks into settlement, if they can remove before that point, it'd be a lot more effective. Well, I, I agree with that, but I also agree with what uh, Mr. Alt said earlier, which is that it's better for these things to be brought in a regular court to begin with rather than removal, and these other things are second best alternatives. It's better to just have them in Article Three courts to begin with. I agree with you totally. I want to thank the chairman for having this hearing today. It's something we need to talk about. I know for the average American man and woman, it may seem a little dry or a little boring, but the reality is it's very, very important. It goes to our fundamental rights as Americans. So I appreciate your work. I yield back. I think I thank the gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, you know, when the chairman of the full committee wanted me to chair this subcommittee, I initially rejected that notion. I'm not an attorney, 
But he pointed out to me, not only did we have jurisdiction over antitrust, we had jurisdiction over administrative law. And I said, well, heck, that's 90% of government. Um, I'll do it. And so um, that's why I agreed to chair that, and that's why we're having this hearing today. There's so much of government that happens in these administrative agencies. One of the notions that came up today was that uh, congressmen don't possess the knowledge or the expertise to be making these decisions about what rules our uh, constituents should live under, that we should defer to experts in these agencies. Uh, Professor Mascott, isn't it true in Article III courts, I mean, these courts decide whether somebody's going to go to prison for life, okay, and they use DNA, for instance, as evidence. Isn't it true that a judge doesn't need to be an expert in, in the topic and that they can call expert witnesses in Article III courts? It's absolutely the case that Article III judges are more experts in the law and not necessarily the facts of the cases that come before them. And also we look to the institution of the jury as um, a piece of the democratic uh, power in our system to be able to adjudicate factual innocence and guilt in the criminal context. And so it's certainly possible to craft a system where we don't have subject matter experts making the final determinations. The one other point is, you know, the unique function of Congress is that you all, each of you, are electorally responsive in this body on every two years to the interests of the American people, and that's not happening in the executive branch. There's one president at the top who represents the whole country, but the agencies are often insulated from presidential supervision, and they're not elected. And if they are making the policy decisions, the interests of the American people cannot possibly be represented purely um, by them. And just one final point, if I, if I may. Well, well let, me, let me comment on that. Doesn't that mean that uh, elections don't matter? If we have people in a branch of government that is elected, right, it's not the judicial branch, which we, the founders recognized we needed to have life terms and, and uh, independence, but in the branch that's elected, if we wall off part of that branch and insulate them from elections, isn't that a bad thing? The, absolutely, the decisions, the policy decisions need to be made here in the elected body. That's how the Constitution was designed, and you're exactly right. When it's shunted over to agencies, we lose the entire um, electoral foundation of our federal system. Mr. Chenoweth, I think you have an interesting perspective having worked for a congressperson and, and then uh, working where you do now and in, in the other roles. What would you say to the notion that congressmen and women don't possess the knowledge to be making these laws that their constituents should live under? I certainly don't think that was uh, Congressman Pompeo's point of view. I think that he thought he was uh, plenty smart enough to be making these, uh, these rules. Uh, but, but I also think that, you know, Cong my experience, I have a lot more faith in Congress than apparently some of the members uh, who spoke today. Uh, Congress does craft very detailed legislation sometimes. It'll, it'll craft the Internal Revenue Code, criminal laws, uh, tariff schedule exemptions. Uh, some of the things that I remember getting lobbied on on Capitol Hill about certain Medicare, Medicaid payments to rural hospitals, things like that. I mean, these things can get extraordinarily detailed. All of those things are voted on uh, by Congress. Uh, Mr. Van Drew mentioned the RAINS Act. You know, I think there's a simplified version of that. Uh, from the rulemaking side, if, if Congress is concerned about having the expertise to delve in and figure out exactly how to craft the regulations, then fine, keep it somewhat the way it is, but tell these agencies, your rules do not go into effect until we vote them up or down. Make it like a base realignment commission situation. Start with the rules that are $100 million or more. And if the agency has a rule like that, then it needs to propose it to Congress and it doesn't go into effect until Congress votes it up or down. If you were to do that, I guarantee you that the rules coming out of the agencies would be 10 times better than they are right now because they wouldn't try to get away with the garbage that they're getting away with now if they knew that it had to go in front of Congress to get approved before it went into effect. In, in my last few seconds, I've got another question for you. Um, you know, in a democracy, and where we're allowing the administrative branch to adjudicate certain things, what practical purpose does a gag order serve? I mean, how does that make our country function better? I, I don't think it does uh, make our country better. I mean, more speech, better speech, free speech is the way that we need to, to be thinking about this in our country, and, and these gag orders are really just uh, self-protection mechanisms on the part of the agency, and they need to go away.
my time's expired and I wanna thank the witnesses for coming here today. Appreciate all four of you and, and what you've added to this discussion and illuminated things that, you know, today we claimed that the American people don't know about. Well, they should know about it and that's why we had this hearing. And so I appreciate the expertise that you bring to it. Um, I wanna thank my ranking member, Mr. Correa from California. And um, that concludes today's hearing. We thank you witnesses for appearing before the committee today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>